Well, hello and welcome to the Restore podcast, where we're doing a series, a monthly series on a conversation about or a con- conversation with at the moment. But um, and we've talked about race, um, we had a conversation around race and racial issues. Uh, we've had a conversation around education and um, kind of well-being within education as well. And we want to have a conversation today about integrity. Uh, so we're we're having conversations about issues that we see in the world around us. Um, You'd have to look very far in the news to see that integrity or the lack thereof um, is evident in the news, particularly in the political arena, uh, within church leadership, um, and just in the the people around us as well. And so today we're going to have that conversation about integrity, what it is, uh, where we've seen it in people, where we've seen it fail in people, and how do we develop a, a life and a character of integrity. So I hope you'll enjoy the conversation. So it's me, uh, I'm Jodie Collins. For those of you who don't know me, I'm part of Restore Community Church. Uh, we also have Ian King, who's the senior leader of Restore Community Church, and Tobias Ngala, who's location lead for Woodford uh, Restore. So you've got the three of us today. Um, we'd be really, really uh, happy to receive feedback on this and um, follow up the conversation so you can email um, questions at restorecc.org.uk if you want to follow up and ask us anything uh, that kind of jumps out to you during this conversation uh, we'd be really happy to follow that up and get back to you so we're going to start off our conversation on integrity um, so I guess the first question to ask is what is integrity just so we're all on the same page um, so I'm going to throw a definition out there and then um, I don't know if Tobias and Ian want to jump in with uh, padding that out a bit on what, what each of you think integrity is. Um, but anyone who's heard me talk before knows I, I love where words come from and integrity, most, lots of people might know this, but comes from the word integer. And integer is a whole number. And so it's about wholeness and it's about um, that kind of wholeness of heart and wholeness of character. And um, kind of being undivided I guess would be a really good description of it and I remember when we when Stuart and I used to take growing young leaders um, course and we did a whole session on character and integrity and there was a beautiful description of uh, if you imagine kind of a circle of your personal life your private life and your public life so the public life being kind of who you are out in the world uh, the, the personal kind of who you are with your friends and family and then the private and it's how, how small a gap there is between those three um, is kind of where integrity sits. And I really kind of like that illustration of it, that it's, it's the, the smaller the gap between those three people, who you are in public, private and personal, kind of shows your integrity and kind of that wholeness. But Tobias, anything uh, that you want to share about kind of the definition of integrity? Yeah, I mean, grew up really understanding integrity to be uh, that if we were to peel off, you know, your the things that cover you, uh, what we know you for in public, would we find that you are the same person in private? And I'm, when I'm talking about private, it's not just being in the room alone, but being even with your family, the people who would be the last people to shame you, you know would they say the same things of you, that you are the same person that people think you are? And for me, that growing up, that definition of integrity uh, stuck with me and, and it's been something like a value. And if you think of it, that's what you want to pursue, that sense of, you know, integer, you know, that sense of it, it balances out in both ends, mm. yeah. Yeah, but, am I the same on the inside as I am on the outside? It's that yeah. it's that question, isn't it? And I know we've talked about before. Yeah, you know, is am I am I the same outside my front door as I am, you know, in the dark? You know, am I that yeah. same person? And um, I think a really good question around that is: Would I be embarrassed or feel shame if people saw the person behind the doors? <laughs> yeah, you know, and that I think that yeah. that is a is a good a tough but a good question to ask when we're saying have I got integrity am I whole am I undivided um am I the same on the inside as the outside and that doesn't mean to say we're uh, you know, we relate differently to different people I think that's kind of the circle thing but actually on the inside am I the same um I'm not kind of 
wearing a mask at all. Actually, you would find that uh, that you would make a lot of money if people found out who you really are, or you would lose, <laughs> or you would lose a lot of money. Uh, you know, so I mean, it's in the world that we live in where scandals are, you know, the news that people want to sell. Uh, so if you peel off someone's mask and found out that they were really not the morally upright person they, they you know, people think they are. On the one side, you know, I've seen people who have turned it into profit, you know. Uh, and on the other side, there are people who would actually have nothing to lose because that's the real person you would find on the other side of the mask. Yeah. 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 You were also talking, Jody, earlier about our um, architectural integrity. Yeah. Mm. So I, I discovered that in construction, um, which clearly I've never been in, but um, they, they talk about the kind of the steel beams having integrity. So you could get a couple of steel look, look the same, um, but when they're, they're put under uh, stress, um, the, the weight that they can support shows their integrity. And it's just a really great analogy, isn't it? Because when we talk about when we're squeezed, our true character comes out. And so I think that's where integrity, when, when we're under stress, integrity shows by the weight you can support because I think there's something about integrity you never have to worry about what you're going to say or people finding out you can just have a peace no matter what the stress or the weight of the situation um yeah so I really like that kind of analogy of kind of that still um according it a beam I'm going to get told by some architect or construction worker that it's not but the still I think they just call it a still don't they but that it the integrity shows by the the weight it can support under stress um, and that's uh, a nice way of talking about integrity as well mm -hmm. and it's so linked to character isn't it and um, I think maybe a couple of people are, are wondering well what's the difference then between integrity and character or, or where do they intertwine um, and I think integrity is is a part of our character but I know Ian you've been thinking a lot around character so and you know we aspire as Christians uh, to have a, a Jesus-like character but what does that what does that really mean? Uh, what are we talking about when we say that sort of thing? Anybody that knows me will know that I like uh, roots of words and, and kind of where they're derived from. Um, and so I, I just spent a bit of time really looking at the words character and uh, what it literally means. And it actually comes from a root Greek word, um, but it means um, at its core, it means to sharpen or to cut in a furrow or to engrave. And it's that sense of something being formed within you, a likeness being created within you is your character. Mm. And actually the word character doesn't have to be good or bad. It can be both. It, it's just what is the mark of your life and what does that look like? And I guess what process do you encourage or invite to shape your character? Because we're all shaped by, um, <laughs> by one thing or another. We're shaped by our background. We're shaped by our values. We're shaped by the culture around us and we will carry the mark of it. And I guess we get to choose what we allow to shape our character. And as followers of Jesus, we want to choose that it's Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the word of God that is shaping our character. So it's cutting away what needs to be cut away. It's speaking in what needs to be spoken in and it's molding and engraving in us the likeness of Jesus. And I love the language around the engraving in because mm. that is it's a process that cuts. So that says it's not easy and it's not straightforward and it, sometimes it will be painful. It also says it's not a quick thing. So it, it, it's not a sticker that gets put on you. You know, I could have a sticker on me that says Ian Christian. Um, but actually, if my everyday life hasn't been formed in the likeness of Jesus, if I haven't faced challenge it is that I've had to work through in terms of the motives of my heart, whether I'm willing to forgive or not, what real love looks like in action, if I haven't been willing to go through that journey, it won't have been engraved on me and it won't have a, a depth and a form in it. And so part of forming godly character is to say my ideal is to be like Jesus and I'm going to create an environment that enables my life to be engraved such that it looks like Jesus. And actually, when we think about that in the Bible, I think what's really interesting is the 
early church didn't call themselves Christians. It wasn't a label that it wasn't the sticker that they put on them. Actually, they were they were called um, it, it, the way because there was a sense of, of people following the way of Jesus. And it's only in Acts chapter 11 at the end of the chapter for the first time, the believers in Antioch were called Christians and Christian means little Christ. And it was the community around who called them little Christs because there was the image and the likeness of Jesus that was engraved in their lives that other people recognized as being the likeness of Jesus. And so I think if we're going to be people who carry a godly character, then we need to encourage that process to shape and engrave on us the likeness of Jesus. And then what we say we are, who we introduce ourselves, the sticker needs to match what I carry in the deepest places of my heart. I uh, just thought that was really interesting in terms of uh, the formation process for character, because as well, um, in the New Testament, there's the word charisma. And, and we often point people into leadership because of, of the, charis, the charisma that they carry. And we often talk about the, uh, the charisma of a leader. And the word charisma actually means grace. It's a gift. And so, but it's not character. It's a different word. And, mm. and I think part of the danger that we get caught in is we come under the power of the charisma and we don't necessarily look at the character and it's the gap between those two that's the problem, which is why for Jesus, he had 30 years to develop his character before he experienced the charisma of the Holy Spirit putting him into ministry. And it's that same process, I think, of, of encouraging the formation of the godly character that underpins then our ability to carry the charisma of God. Whereas if you have leaders and it's their charisma that draws people in, but there's no character, that seems like it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So much in there to unpack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Tobias, you want to respond? And, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I, as you're talking, just really getting this uh, idea of uh, the, the engine and the coaches, you know. And, you know, when you see the engine and the person seated in it, he always looks very lonely. And he's just one person going to drive this train. Uh, and but we just do not see just how much that engine carries. You know, the moment that engine crashes, all these thousands of people in the coach are disappointed. They can't get to their workplaces. And as you're speaking, I'm just, that's the thought I'm getting. You know, character is that engine of, of you know, for that life of integrity, that, that engine that gets people there, you know. Mm -hmm. And the moment it, it falls apart, you know, it's just how many people didn't get to their destination because, you know, and that's, I think Christ, uh, Paul uses uh, those words, like he says, he's, he's like a woman in childbirth and, and he wants to see Christ formed in people, Christ formed in you. I guess that's mm. what we are, we, are, we are looking at, yeah. yeah. And Paul talks as well about, you know, imitate Christ as I imitate, you know, yeah. and that, and imitation is an interesting word to use, but that to be, have that Jesus character and I yeah. I don't want to jump ahead too far in our conversation but I think that what you picked up on in that that charisma v character um yeah. is is crucial to where maybe things have gone awry um in culture but also in the church but we've if you go back to kind of new testament or when Jesus was walking yeah he was more often than not he was called rabbi and rabbis had disciples, uh, followers, apprentices. And the, the goal for, for those apprentices, those tongue was to, to become like their rabbi. So they would literally follow them around and to, to imitate them, to become like them. And, and that's, you know, we are called as Christians more than anything to be like Jesus. It talks about our transformation, becoming Christ-like, you know, being transformed more and more into his likeness and somewhere along the way we that message has been dropped um in popular church culture and it's about our, our gifting and what you're called yeah and i've i've just sensed recently it was just a real sadness around that that actually the 
the one thing, one of the main things I, I think that we're being called back to is to remember to be like Christ, to be with Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, John Mark Comer and his practice, you know, be like, be with Jesus and become like Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, you know, who would Jesus be if he was in your skin, in your family, in your time of history? And, and that's character, that's that wholeness, isn't it? Of, mm-hmm. of being like, of being like Christ. And um, we seem to have, have lost that, that awe of character and that yeah. the aspiration for character because we live in a shortcut world and yeah, yeah that's really sad. And, and yeah, there's, I mean, it takes us on nicely, I guess, to talk about why, why has that been lost? You know, why is integrity less value today or um, not desired as much um, perhaps or, and glossed over um, in in politics and you know in the church and in in everyday life and um, the phrase that I think I read John Maxwell had written it um, but uh, that one of our the biggest enemies of integrity is this phrase fake it till you make it <laughs> and so that seems to just sum up our culture in so many ways you present this Make it till you make it. You know, get yourself there, and then you'll work it out along the way. And um, but that's become the the enemy to integrity mm-hmm. in some ways because it sets you up for failure because you're not that person you're presenting. <laughs> you're not whole. You're mm-hmm. not an integer. Um, so yeah, there's and the, the image and performance is rewarded more than more than integrity and character. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, should we should we talk on that? For, that could probably be some time, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, quickly, just thinking about that, you know, it's where we place our value, you know, mm. and, you know, we, we, you talk about how do you create values. Uh, one of it is, you know, what you celebrate, people quickly understand and, and, and run to it as a value. And I think when you look at just even from a family perspective where you, you start, what do you celebrate? Uh, in the family, uh, do you celebrate truthfulness or do you celebrate mm. performance? You know, mm. then when you come to the public life, it becomes it's become a very audience-driven kind of living. Uh, so that you know, if I have a following, then I am influential, then I have impact. Uh, but it does not come from you know even just leaning back on that example of Jesus. As a, as a rabbi, it's not, here's my life, I have opened for you, see who I am and how I live my life. Come and follow me based on that. You know, to the extent that Jesus, you know, people ask him, when do you leave? And he would say, well, I actually don't have a place to leave. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and still people would follow him. But when you look at modern culture, that, that would be a sh- that would be a shame, you know, like, mm. oh, I don't want you to know where I live because I'm still faking it. You know, I, I still haven't reached that place. So when we shift the value, when we assign wrong value to, to something, people tend to follow down that road. And mm. we in leadership tend to be people who point people to what is valuable. And so... If I point people to, you know, wonderful sermons, you know, preached by a, a well-dressed preacher and all that, but I don't point them to my life, that's really what they're going to value. You know, just like we've seen, if I point people to miracles, then they will not think about spiritual formation. They'll think, give me the miracles and I quickly become very popular. Don't tell me about my character. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I think that's one of the ways we fall into that trap. I think that's really interesting, Tobias, because I'm I'm slightly older than both of you, um, but I, I can remember because um, I studied um, politics at school, then economics at university, and uh, and sociology, kind of how society works. And I remember in the 1980s, one of the phrases that came into the UK political arena was um, that um, what you do in your private life can stay in your private life and it doesn't have to affect your public life. So up until before the 1980s, if a politician was found to be um, having an affair 
or, um, or being fraudulent with your taxes or something like that, they would instantly resign because there was a ministerial code of conduct. And if you breach the terms of that, then you uh, had to resign. So there was a valuing of whole life or integrity. Mm. Um, in the 1980s, they, a new phrase started to be banded about, which was what someone does in their private life doesn't affect their public life. And actually, it was a lie. It is a lie. It's a lie that was sown by politicians into the culture. Now, our suspicion has to be that the people selling the lie were the people who knew there was a dichotomy between what they were living in private and what they were living in public. Mm. And so the sense was we should look at who's successful and not worry about their private life. Um, the reality is that is a lie because who I am is who I am and will flow into every area of my life. And so if, if I lie to my wife, I will lie to my colleagues. If I steal in my taxes, I will steal from the treasury if I'm, if I'm the chancellor of, of, of the exchequer, because I will bring my character, the who I am into every area. And I think what's happened from a cultural angle, certainly from in the political arena, is because we bought into the lie that what we do in private doesn't impact what we do in public, we've actually then come to a position that we don't trust our leaders because we know that they're not being honest. And I think, well, that's because we bought into a lie that integrity doesn't matter. At the same time, we've stepped into a celebrity culture. And so everything is about entertainment. You know, a few years ago, it, it was like, you know, every parent wanted their kids either to be a footballer, because that was the quickest way to make a huge amount of money, or a pop star, because that was the other way of doing it. But we're very focused on the on the spotlight. And as, as church, I think we've wanted to be relevant. So we've wanted to be able to speak into that arena. The problem with that is we end up without maybe meaning to, putting people in a celebrity position. So by the time we put them on the stage and we shine the lights on them and whatever else, we put them into an entertainer category rather than an authentic follower of Jesus. And it's easy in that category to end up projecting something, you know, because you end up as a preacher having to think about what's the shirt I wear or what does my hair look like? Or what do I look like on camera? Because we're being asked to do those, but they're actually all the questions normally you would ask of a performer, not a rabbi or a disciple. And so I think it's, it's, it's just standing back for a moment and saying, hang on, actually, what are we portraying and what are we valuing? Because if it's an authentic life, we've got to make sure we keep that authentic, transparent life alongside if we do end up on a stage there's not necessarily anything bad with being on a stage you know jesus um made his own stage in one sense out of a boat to speak to the crowds there's nothing wrong with speaking to a crowd and enhancing the ability to do that but we can't make that our audience that we're trying to please we have to you know and, and i need to have a a, a a pure oneness with god that's most important. And that's what I then need to speak from to the crowd, if that makes sense. Mm. Well, it's the audience of one, isn't it? And which goes back to who you are when no one's mm. watching. Um, so yeah. who am I, not who do you see I am? Um, and I think that that cry for authenticity, um, that, that is just there for, I think the generation coming out are, are crying out for authenticity. And I think there's, I mean, that's a whole different podcast conversation, but you know, they're grasping at things to be their authentic selves, you know, whatever. But, but I think what I want to pick up on from what you said is it speaks into that when you talk about the stage and the celebrity, it speaks into what you said earlier about the, the charisma, the gifting, and the character. And, um, you know, it's often been said your gift will get you there, but your character will keep you there. I, that quote's been said so many times, I don't know who originally said it, but um, it's, it's basically. You know, the, the gift will get you there, the charisma will get you there, the, the image might get you there, the performance might get you there, but it's your character that will keep you. And that's what we've, we've lost. And in, in the world of the internet, um, someone can go viral, you know, your, your gift, whether, you know, let's, let's stick with the church for a moment, but you, you know, if you're a preacher, um, speaker, you know, to, you know, and you can become an overnight sensation and that's happened to some people in the christian yeah. world 
And so they go from an audience of maybe 30 or maybe 100, 500 to thousands, millions, and suddenly have this platform and this pressure and this adulation. But they didn't have, as you said, 30 years of character building like Jesus. Um, mm-hmm. And so the gift got them there, but there's not the, or going back to the still, there's not the strength in it, the integrity in it yeah. to hold the weight of that moment. And mm-hmm. so we see these high um, celebrity, for want of a better word, leaders, um, buckle under the weight of celebrity because we, well, we weren't made for it. We were made to be servants and saints. We weren't made to be mm-hmm. celebrities. And yeah, I think that's one of the biggest cultures that we've, we've created as church um, and bought into that has helped cause this um, crisis of integrity. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think if you think about the um, heroes in the Bible, um, nearly all of them, their most fruitful time in ministry was the latter stage of their life. And so they might have been singled out when they were young and they might have known they had a core. Um, but if you follow through the biblical story, they then went through periods of character formation. So Moses knew from a baby. Moses was set apart as a baby. He was supernaturally mm. uh, preserved. Uh, and he was brought up in the king's palace. So, so he was brought up for leadership. He was brought up for greatness. But then, you know, he had... 40 years in the palace, but then 40 years in the wilderness, where he, where a lot was broken down in him and remolded. And again, we get that sense of, of engraving, where the character mm. and nature of God was engraved within him. And then the 80 to 120 years was actually his years of, of leadership. And with David, although he was called out as a, as a young guy and anointed by Samuel, he then had years that he was being pursued by Saul. His life was trying to be taken from him, that he had to go through a whole load of squeezing trials before he got to the place of, of actually becoming king. And then he blew it with character issues along the way. Or if you think of Joseph, you know, Joseph knew from an early age he was anointed for, for greatness. The worst thing for Joseph was to be released into that as a teenager, and he made a hash of it because he needed that journey of character formation. And I think part of what we've done as a society, and you mentioned it earlier, Jodie, is we look for the instant. You know, we we microwave cook rather Mm. than bake. Um, And the problem with that is we don't value the inner journey and we don't value the place of character formation. And so for some of it, we've actually got to shift what we value. I think it's easy in church to want to be on the stage, to want to be at the front, because that's what we celebrate, like Tobias was saying, that, that's what mm. we celebrate week in, week out. It was actually what we need to be celebrating is serving behind the scenes, loving your neighbors, forgiving people. We need to be celebrating those things because it's in those places that, that the the motives of our heart get dealt with when you're standing in the front with a microphone and uh, and a bible in your hand you don't have to deal on the whole with the motives of your heart but Mm -hmm. when you're at home you've got to make a choice to love your spouse even though you don't feel like it when you get betrayed by somebody who's a really close friend it's those choices in those moments that determine the character and who you're becoming. And so somehow we've got to spin around. So instead of trying to make a quick fix solution, you know, my three steps to Christian leadership or three steps to whatever name, Inc. Ministries, we've got to get rid of all of that and go right back down to what is a life lived with Jesus look like? And what is the pathway of crafting and shaping my heart what does that look like you know David a number of times says to me you know search search me O Lord and and test my heart see if there's any wicked way within me it's that inner journey I think I read somewhere that the the character is about the inner journey the charisma is about the outer and so it's valuing the back to what we were saying earlier but it's valuing the character and that process of formation over the charisma you know David slew Goliath but with smooth stones that had been honed in a river and it's putting ourselves in the place in the spirit of God that we get our character honed and formed. Mm. You know it's interesting you know that you bring that perspective 
Because when you study Paul's life, and you know, when you study Paul as an example to the people he's writing to, so he's writing to Titus, he's writing to Timothy, you will see something like a thread running in his letters. And one of it is, so for example, in, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he says, watch over your life and your doctrine. And then he uses a, a word that I think you alluded to, persevere in them. He said that sense of staying in this, you know, keep doing this, watching over your life and your doctrine, which is how you live and what you say and what you believe in, what's your doctrine, what do you teach? Uh, and persevering that. So perseverance is one thing that we see when it comes to living a life of integrity has been taken away from most people. So most people want to be quick in, you know, I want to, I want to make it quick. Mm -hmm. Now the problem of making it quick is the faster you come, the faster you disappear. And that's not what, mm -hmm. that's something we, we fail to tell people that, if you show up before your time, you will also really fade away really fast. And it's really back to, to character and charisma. Uh, is that you showed up really fast because you had the gifting, but you didn't have the persevering part of it. You didn't persevere in your teach, in, the, in your doctrine, in your life. Uh, and you end up quickly taken out of the picture. And I'm reminded of also what Paul uses he, when he writes to Timothy, he says, do not let anyone despise you because you're young. Mm -hmm. And then he uses an important word there. He says, be an example to people. And I think that's when it comes to integrity, what kind of example am I being to mm -hmm. people? Yeah. <clears throat> really good. Yeah. Really good. And so we've, we've covered a lot of ground quite, mm -hmm. quite quickly, but... Um, I wonder if there's something, um, so we talked a lot around kind of what integrity looks like. Um, what, what happens when it's not there? What, what's the danger of, of living a life without integrity? So there's probably different arenas to address that in, but in terms of a public figure, maybe a political or a church leader, but then for, for you and I, uh, regular people, you know, what, what's the dangers of, of living a life without integrity. Um, so we kind of speak into that and, and chat around that for a, a moment. We've probably all seen it. That's probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've probably seen it uh, on the high profile level. Yeah. Um, within the last couple of years, we most certainly have. Um, we could name off the top of our heads uh, quite a few. Um, there's been, you know, Ravi Zacharias, uh, which, uh, yeah, I might cry. Um, Bill Heibel, uh, we've had recent Hillsong um, situation. I could go on and on and on. Um, and, you know, and that's not to single them out. That's not uh, to make a judgment on them, but to say that there is a crisis and that we need to be alert and that, you know, we need to be on watch when there is something happening about a lack of integrity. Um, that is causing uh, this to happen. And so how can we how can we see it? How can we recognize it? And then we'll go on after that. how do we counter that and how do we choose to step into a life of integrity? But yeah, let's let's um, chat a bit around that. Well let me jump in and Ian then you can follow up, I guess. Um, it's actually when you think of it, if you've heard of the saying, you know you know, falling down a slippery, slippery slope, you know, and, and that's the thing about leadership is people tend to start falling and not recognizing it. And the problem is because the culture has been created in a way that there is no permission to say some things. So for example, you know, we could twist the word of God like, touch not the anointed of God, do no harm to his prophet, can be the extreme of do not call out an infraction in a leader. And so the leader gets to be isolated day by day. He's getting isolated to the place where no one can tell him anything. And then he walks into the, the realm of telling white lies and feeling like, well, that was not a liar. I was just trying to 
make things right. You know, in the political scene, they talk about the fixer, you know, mm. always, you know, that public relation person who always makes things look right, even when they are not. And then the further part of it is when you think it doesn't hurt anyone, it's just my life. It's not hurting anyone. Mm. And when you go down that hill, you're sliding, you're sliding. And what it does is the opposite. You know, that little white lie, you know, that thought that it doesn't hurt anyone is what we've seen with the recent cases of just how many people have left even the church. And now their hope is not in God because their leaders have disappointed them. And, you know, Jesus used very harsh words for such people. He said, if any one of you leads astray these little ones, it would be for him worth it that they put a milestone on his neck and he's drowned into the sea. And that's how Jesus was when he thought about, I'm placing you as a leader. It's not just for you. It's the people that also follow you. What will happen in their life? It's devastating. Like, and I thought of about the recent cases. For me, I was really broken. I was like, how, how? I, I didn't see it coming. I didn't expect it to happen. And it just, and then it put me on the spotlight because I'm a leader and started asking myself, what, what about me? Is there hope for me, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting, Tobias, just listening to you and, and hearing, I think I mentioned it earlier, the, the, that we can buy into lies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you were saying w was actually just recognizing that we mustn't come under some of those lies, like this doesn't matter. <laughs> this twisting of the truth doesn't really matter, or this little thing doesn't matter. It does matter because it's my character. And it's keeping in that place of... Um, of knowing that in a sense there, but by the grace of God go I, and, and that we don't, um, it, it's so easy, isn't it, to judge other people <laughs> and say, how could they? That could never happen to me. But the reality is the people that we've mentioned or that we're aware of are genuine people who wanted to serve Jesus and who love Jesus with a passion, but somehow, they've ended up instead and caught out. And um, I, I, some people kind of plaster it all over social media, you know, the latest Hillsong scandal, the latest whatever. I can't bring myself to do that because I just feel such a sense of grief over it and such a sense of grief on so many levels. I, I feel a sense of grief for, um, for the folk themselves because their whole ministry will now be defined by where they've ended up. And a lot, of, a lot of the folk have had significant impact into people's lives. Jesus has really used them. And now they're gonna end up um, a shell of who God wanted them to be. And I feel such grief at that. I, I feel such grief that their legacy has gone just like that um, for many people. Equally, and more so, I feel grief for the victims. In all of those situations, there's been there's been a victim, there's yeah. been somebody who's been able to use their charisma and their platform to actually um, use their power to draw people into things they never should have. And there's, there's victims. We, as a church, we need to be a church that rescues victims, not a church that creates victims. And, and I feel heartbroken at that. That is, and then I feel heartbroken at what that does to the reputation of the church. That we end up with documentaries over, you know, the inner workings of a church. I, I just think God's heart must be broken over that, and and the reputation of His body, His bride, is like dragged through the mud. And I think God save us. From that and, and it, it's it, in some ways it's, it, it's really hard that there's been a wave of these things um, on another level I think maybe it's good because if there is hiddenness it needs exposing to get us free from it I, mean, I, I think God's heart isn't to expose people publicly in the press and everything else and 
get them arrested. You know, but David needed a Nathan to come alongside him for him to recognize the deception he was under. And that enabled him to repent and be restored. And actually, if the church is going to become what the church needs to be in this, this day and age, if we are going to be marked out with a different likeness, we need to welcome the purifying of God. And much as I hate people having to step out of ministry, much as I hate people being exposed, do you know, a pure church is what we really need because we are living in a dark society and we need a pure church that shines with the um, radiance of Jesus. And that will only come if from the very core of who we are, we welcome that purifying and we say, God, God, will you search me? And, and, and some people may know this, but when I was first training in ministry, I trained in a congregation that was led by uh, a 28 year old worship leader. And he developed um, a really um, virulent form of cancer. And the whole church, part of a big church, um, a really big church in London, the whole church was praying and fasting over it. And uh, as time went on, um, people started to get words around deception and hidden things. Um, and then eventually it came into light that he'd been leading a double life um, morally. Um, and um, he repented, um, but within four weeks he was dead at 28. And we went through then as a church, a whole process of, of grieving, pain, questioning, whole load of things um but i think we rediscovered the fact that how we live matters and it talks in the bible a lot about a fear of god and i think maybe we've lost a little bit in our god loves everyone we've lost a sense of the awesomeness and the holiness mm. of god and the fact that we need to respect and honor what is holy you know in the old testament Uzzah died because he didn't respect the holiness mm. of the ark of the covenant so in in the new testament you can say well that's the old testament but then we get grace in the new testament which is fine until you get to acts chapter five and you get ananias and sapphira and mm. in the midst of a revival a couple choose to lie and they end up dying just like that and then Paul writes when, you know, we, we quote from Corinthians when we lead people through communion and, uh, and we talk about searching your heart. But Paul goes on and he says, some of you are sick because you dishonor the taking of communion. And we had to face the fact we had a worship leader who was leading us into communion every week whilst leading a double life. Mm -hmm. And that's not a light thing to do we talk about carrying the presence of god that's not a light thing to do that's saying I, my body is the ark of the covenant and i want the holy god to dwell within me so i need to clean out my covenant my ark of the covenant so that god can dwell in there and if i'm not willing to do that i'm actually in a dangerous place and i think we need to rediscover a right perspective on holiness mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about you know the refined by fire, and you know I yeah. I was quickly trying to look it up, but I failed. But I, I assume engraving uses heat, um, and that there's that there's something in um, you know our, our characters are that engraving on the marking of us of marking Jesus comes through that you know through heat through, through yeah. fire and we have to say god would you refine me and you know we joked earlier before we recorded that you know image is so important we have so many shows like the 60 minute makeover show you know it's about what you present there's no 60 year character development show because that that's not you know valued enough and it's not what people and it goes back to what Tobias said right in the beginning kind of what we value in our home yeah. and it's those little things because no one no one wakes up and is a prolific X, Y, Z. You know, yeah. Yeah. it starts with the small. And I've also been in a team in ministry where um, somebody was leading a, a, a double life. And, you know, when it got exposed, it was 
heartbreaking um, because, you know, you don't, you never expect someone you're ministering alongside and you're, you know, praying alongside and you're on team with and to, um, you know, reaching out to a community with, to, to have that, that failing. And, and he didn't wake up one day and do what he did. It started mm. and we could track it back with a little lie here, a little bit of deception there. And it's that lack of, it's that, it goes, what you said, that it just doesn't matter that little and white lie or it does matter because it, it almost like it opens the gate to the next one. Mm. And, it, and it numbs it. Mm. I remember Bill in Tenerife, he probably still says it, so if he's listening, but he talks about the Holy Spirit kind of being like a cog inside of us. And when we ignore the Holy Spirit and, um, and kind of that, you know, Holy Spirit can find the constancy of that, that finger from God saying, mm, that's not right. And when we ignore that, we almost dull the cog and we don't kind of sense God's spirit as much anymore. And, we're, and it's the same, I think, with the lying that we, or whatever it is that goes against, that's not pure, that's not whole, that is undivided, that isn't who I am on the outside and inside. Whenever we uh, kind of push that boundary, we're opening up to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And um, because we've numbed, numbed ourselves um, and we've started to devalue the truth and we de devalue character and we devalue the importance of integrity and so we end up with these messes and so this conversation isn't just for those in leadership this conversation isn't just for those in in public arenas and who are who have the the risk of being found out by the tabloids it actually it's about the everyday because it's about Am I being truthful? Am I being pure? Am I being whole as a follower of Jesus? Am I being marked by Jesus? Because actually, if we're truly going to be followers of Jesus and point people towards him and not be found out as a hypocrite, you know, and living a double life or double mask, and maybe it won't be as extreme as some of these cases we've talked about and we've seen and lived through in our own lives. But, you know, I, I dread the thought of, so we say, oh, she says all this, but she, you know, she, yeah, you know, at home, she's, yeah, you know, there could be not like to, to devalue and mock God in that way, which is mm. what you go back to about that fear of that lack of the fear of God. That uh, I don't know, I know I'm probably going on a bit and rambling, but I've just got so much. I, I so want us to grab a hold of the importance of this issue. And the importance of this is nothing else. Let's become whole, undivided, upright people. Um, because it's so dangerous to live without that. Um, because we, every time we ignore that, we open up the, an opportunity for the enemy to get a foothold to something uh, darker and something um, more deceitful. And I guess that's probably where I was trying to say. But yeah, someone else jump in quick. <laughs> yeah, that, when I think about uh, the subject you're talking about, I think of anyone, you know, even if you're not in leadership or whatever significant leadership you're talking about, church leadership or political leadership or public space leadership, and you're just a mother at home, you know, maybe just raising your children or, you know, your retired dad, there is a danger, you know, like Jody said, there's a danger of thinking that I don't need to. I mean, I'm just stuck mm -hmm. in my house. I don't need to. The problem with that is anyone who thinks they don't need to live a life of integrity has already bought into the lie itself. They, and they're now on the downward uh, stretch of things. You know, it's, it's a grandfather who your children later find out that's not really who you are. And you just imagine the danger. It's going to be generational. Uh, it's going to be passed on generation. You know, it's 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 a mother stealing something from maybe a shop, and the child sees that, and they think, well, that's just, you know, <laughs> my child doesn't have to, you know, it doesn't affect my child, and then you think it doesn't, but that's when the Bible now comes in to use the word iniquity, because then now God follows that to the second and the third and the fourth generation, mm. you know. And, and the call to the regular, those who call themselves, I'm just a regular person, is just, 
you know, Jesus said, uh, John writing, John the apostle writes, he says, walk in the light as he is in the light. And you will have fellowship with God and with one another. So you can see it's an invitation, just like you're talking about this, they are fellowship with God. And then there is the horizontal fellowship with one another. That koinonia, that community is only enhanced when we expose ourselves before God and say, let your light shine through me and show me what I'm hiding. And I want to correct that part. Yeah. 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 You just saying about the, the mother reminded me. Um, just the other week, I was with a friend and was about how she was trying to get her son into um, a, an attraction and under a certain age was, was cost a little bit less. And so she told him to say he was a certain age. And so uh, she, they lied to get him in for a, a, a discounted price. And then a couple of days later, he barefaced lied to her about something. And I just, I said to her, you taught him to lie. <laughs> like, yeah. But it's, it's a funny version or not funny of what we're saying, you know, that little, what we, you know, we may be a parent, we may be a colleague, but we need to be whole and clear on, on those things. And we think, oh, it's just a little white lie, but actually it has an impact and can go on to the generation and the people around us. So how do we live differently? How, how do we counter this? this devaluing of integrity in our culture how do we how do we choose to live a life of culture uh, live a life of integrity and uh, what does that look like and how do we counteract that as christians jump in with a couple of things to start us and, and this big question isn't it i think number one we need to see it mm -hmm. i think my heart really for us having this conversation is is that together and as followers of Jesus we might see it and see it is an issue because quite often you just become blinded by it and, and then we be, become discipled by the culture as opposed to from, from Jesus and, and, and the reality is at the moment the culture doesn't see it and the culture doesn't say it and the culture doesn't call it out it doesn't actually call out on the right issues it calls out quite often sweeping generalization so don't totally quote me on that but quite often we end up calling out the wrong things in culture. And, and we've got to root ourselves back into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so, number one, we've got to see it. And I think there is a deception quite often with, um, with every leader that I've worked with who's ended up um, being exposed as, as living a double life. Um, there's been a deception around them and there's been a pattern, there's been a web of lies. And I think there is a, a spirit of deception around. I, I, and I think there's been a spirit of deception as a nation and globally that we've bought into around leadership and character not, um, not um, being important. So in a sense, we need a revelation. We just need to wake up to the importance of it, I think, number one. I think number two is we all need places where we can um, take off our roles and our fronts and be known for who we are. And I, and I think um, someone mentioned earlier, I think, I think Tobias mentioned it earlier, isolation. And I think we must, must, must refuse to be isolated, to let ourselves be isolated. And we have to have some relationships where we're grounded in. I need some relationships where I'm Ian. I'm not the leader of Restore. I need some relationships that are on that are peer to peer and there's nothing at risk in where I can be honest and transparent and I'm not always wearing my leader's hat because there's danger if I'm always wearing a hat because I'm embracing a role. And at the end of the day, I need to be able to be me. And, and I've, I'm, I'm not perfect by any means. Most of you will know that already. Um, speak to my wife. She will happily share where I'm not. But um, I've intentionally, particularly over the last couple of years that have been a challenge for anybody to lead through. I've made sure I've got friends where um, there's nothing at stake in the relationship. I can just be me and they can just be them. So that for me is, is friends wider than just in Restore. 
because uh, there's dynamics that come along with being the leader of Restore. So I need some relationships where I, I can just be Ian. I've also intentionally um, made sure I have regular appointments with someone who will ask me who I am and ask the difficult questions and that I can talk to openly about what's going on in my life because that becomes an anchor. And that, that's about having close relationships where we can be accountable. And I think unless we value the importance of that and we're willing to listen to what those people say and answer them honestly, we're gonna be at risk. Yeah, when I look up and, and at uh, our path of discipleship, you know, generally when I look at how we do discipleship in our day and time, uh, part of it breaks my heart because it, it is so built around information uh, as opposed to living life with or being an example to so that you follow my example. And I think one of the ways we can go back to that is even just think about Joseph when he was, you know, caught in this situation with Potiphar's wife. And when we teach that back in the days in our youth group, you would teach it from the point of view that, hey, look, he had a chance, you know, and he would have made a, you know, taken advantage of that chance and no one would have known about it. But then there's something that's underlined that makes Joseph not do that. Uh, he really has nothing to do with the power of Potiphar, the power of Pharaoh, and what the consequences of the state would be over him. It's really, it's really the, well, how would I call it? It's his value for God, you know? It's, mm -hmm. He says, why would I do that and sin against my God? He really has had nothing to do with Potiphar. You get, like, it's always about, why would I do that? And I, when I think about discipling my kids, I don't want them to think, oh, you're falling into trouble with dad. I want them to have a higher view of consequence, not that there is no consequence because dad did not see me. Dad did not catch me. I want them to feel that there is a consequence greater than dad, greater than their mm -hmm. teachers. And that's one way to cultivate. And, you know, nothing, even God, you know, God, you know, in his word, he says that nothing that's hidden will remain hidden. And that, that strikes me with some godly fear, you know. <laughs> it strikes me with some godly fear. Like, I could keep hiding, but the word of God is very clear. Nothing that's hidden will stay hidden. It will come to light mm -hmm. at some point. And so that gives me, the way the Bible says, godly fear leads to repentance. So I'm able to change because of godly fear yeah mm. yeah we when we've talked about spiritual formation before spiritual discipline mm. practice habits uh, the way of jesus all mm. of those things being one uh we often find people find solitude time with jesus alone mm. very hard and because of sometimes what brings up it, it, i just thought of it when you said about you know Joseph was so aware and that was a sin against God that actually because if it's oh I might get caught or what will so-and-so think of me we're still valuing image yeah and God sees the inner man not the outer and God judges us on the inner and it, it's the rewiring isn't it because we have to again the fear of God but being so aware actually it's the audience of one it's me and Jesus and to get back to that and to, to strip back everything else. And I remember that, that team member I spoke about before when he got caught and I was exposed, you know, to, I remember sitting with him and he was sobbing and sobbing. And um, I, I said to someone else, he was really sorry. And she just said, he's really sorry he got caught. And she had a real disturbance, <laughs> she knew. And he, he was sorry he got caught. I'm not sure. I'm not sure he was sorry in the true sense of the word. And it was, because it was about the image, it was about 
what it meant for his reputation rather than the the one-on-one with God and valuing that and so I think the how do we live differently we spend time with Jesus and we 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 say with all integrity with all with all our search me oh God search me oh God you know let there be nothing in me no dark spots on my heart um and you know what what is dark let it be exposed to light and I think having that that community around sin isolates it just does we because of the shame and the embarrassment and and so how do we I think being in those friendships that you spoke of and being in a community uh, a small group a friendship group whatever that might be for whoever's listening and holding really short account with them and um, because the other thing about kind of the little lies leading to the bigger lies is also the secrets layer upon secrets with the web of deception I think you called it Ian. and actually if we keep short account it just cuts that off if we're quick to say do you know what I messed up today and we have those honest conversations no judgment but that accountability is out in the open and you know I was I was divided today I was not whole um, and whatever that is um, and to, to be around one another and grow authentic relationships um, which which value integrity and value purity as well and the, I mean the Bible's got a lot to say about community and being with one another um, and going back to your your sharpening uh, obviously those yeah. the great uh, iron sharpens iron, iron. Or, yeah I was also steel of integrity sharpens steel of integrity <laughs> we'll, we'll rephrase it <laughs> So I was also going to say, um, Jodie, this is so clearly there at the start of the Bible. The first thing that Adam and Eve do after they sin is to hide. Yeah. And they put on fig leaves to hide from one another because they're carrying a sense of shame and guilt yeah. and they start hiding from God. And when our life isn't where it needs to be, because we know that um, we're living a double life, we put on a disguise or a front and we start to separate and hide. And that's one of the great warning signs. You said, Jody, about secrecy. Um, one of the key things is about being transparent and refusing to have yeah. secrets, hidden areas that no one can talk to me about. It, 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 hidden sides of my character that I'm not willing to bring out into the light. As soon as we get caught in that, we all need a place where we can, where we can be um, open with someone so we're not hiding because they hid from one another and they hid from, um, from God. And that's what we do. And that then puts us in a dangerous place, particularly if we're in ministry. I think the other thing I, I, I felt, I just want to say this, we were speaking a couple of minutes ago about the fear of God, and um, I don't think you can, um, I don't think you can work up the fear of God, you need a revelation, you need to see it, like I was saying earlier, if you were listening to us earlier, and you don't understand what we're talking about, or you don't get it, and you're in ministry, can I suggest you step out of ministry because you're in a dangerous place? Yeah. If you don't really get the, it matters, God, how I'm living. If you don't really get, God, if I mess up on this, I'm disappointing you and putting people at risk. If you don't get that, but if it's all about my ministry, my reputation, my mm -hmm. Actually, I think you need to step aside for a season and be freed from something that will be a distraction and get back to the place of Jesus. It's about you and it's about pleasing you. And that's more important than anything else. Yeah, it's really true. We probably need to, to wrap up. We've been talking for an hour. We probably, knowing us, we could probably keep going, but um, maybe we'll do a part two. But um. I think also worth saying if if you're listening and as we've spoken about hiddenness and um kind of those those parts of you or who you are that maybe are not whole that are feel a bit in the dark and 
and feeling isolated. Um, get in touch with us. Um, our heart and our, our prayer is that we all become more like Jesus. And when things remain dark and hidden, the enemy can have a field day. And we don't want that for you. We don't want that for our church. Uh, we don't want that for the kingdom of God. We don't want that for ourselves. And, and so there's no judgment. There's no shame. Um, I'm going to tell a really quick story from my part. And I have told it before. Um, there was a season several years back uh, when I, before I was part of this tour, I was at another church and um, I had found myself uh, watching stuff on TV that uh, was sexual um, and not not who I was, was not Jesus-like, put it that way. And I found myself in that kind of place and I felt so ashamed. Um, and I, it was hidden, it was dark, and I didn't know what to do with it. And then one Sunday, my, we were at the end of a service, and the, the church leader, she said, uh, if anyone's got anything you want to pray about, and, yeah, off the back of the preach, um, then yeah, come up front. And it had nothing to do with the preach. <laughs> but I went up to her and said, can I chat with you? And we went into the office, and I took a deep breath. and said I've got to tell you something and I told her and it was like I could breathe again and so I know what it feels like to have something hidden I know what it feels like to not be whole and to be uh, undivided and that wasn't an extreme double life by any stretch of the imagination but it was something that was not who I was I wasn't the same on the inside at that time who I was being on the outside and so I know that pain and I know that fear. And I just want to say it was the best decision I ever made was to, to speak to her and the kindness in her response and the love in her response and the acceptance and the prayer and the journey out of that was um, just so special. And it's why I feel so passionate about this um, because I've seen it in a little way in my own life, but I've also seen it completely implode. Um, in ministries and in people's lives and I've seen the, the damage it does and the hurt it does and I just want to say if you if any of this has touched you and you want to grow in integrity and character if you haven't got those people around you then we would love to to take that first step with you um, and and please know there will be no judgment at all um, we we just want to pray with you and journey with you and uh, and be iron sharpening iron uh, together and um, just want to say that and yeah Ian any any last words Tobias any final thoughts I uh, thank you for sharing that I uh, I'm just thinking for people who are feeling like will there be restoration and sometimes the picture of restoration is really skewed and, and messed up in our day and time because we think if I'm a leader and I was leading maybe hundreds of people, that my restoration should be that I go back to leading a hundred people. And we forget that maybe that's not really what restoration looks like. Uh, God is more interested in who you are and who you're becoming than the people you lead, you know, and the hundreds of ministries or, you know, things that you do. He wants you. And, and so the first thing God will do is restore you. When you come back to him, he will restore you. You might not gain the riches and everything that surrounded you. But that's really what, that's not what who you, that's not who you are. So mm -hmm. just want to encourage you that restoration doesn't look grand. It is something you can reach out to. You, you know, God wants to restore who you are, not what's around you really. Uh, and the stuff that people were celebrating around you, yeah. Mm. Really good, Tobias. And again, that's about what we value, isn't it? You know, my relationship mm. with Jesus and being at one with Him, and and nothing hidden from Him, is more important than than my ministry. And actually, none of us 
anything that God does is by grace through us anyway. So never mind ministry anyway. It, it's it's who God's it's the gifting that God's put with within me anyway. And and again, that's just part of our. I hate it when people talk about my ministry because <laughs> um, it isn't. It's God's gift to me that I need to cooperate with God for the Holy Spirit to flow through for it to become a reality. And again, it's about having the right perspective on all of these things. I've got nothing else to say, Jody, other than as a church, my heart's cry is that we value um, authenticity, we value transparency, we value spiritual formation, and we value that above what the world might call success because it's that that will put a, a firm foundation under our feet that will mean that God will be able to bless us as we seek to uh, minister and, and honour Jesus. And I would just reiterate, if you're watching this and you know that you've got stuff in your life that isn't right, and the reality is we've all got some stuff it's in some shape or form, um, let's bring it to Jesus. Let's ask him to help us deal with it. Um, where we need to, where it's helpful is preparing confession. You know, it talks in, in James, doesn't it, about confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. There's freedom, there's liberation in confession, in coming out of the darkness, standing in the light. It frees you, like you were saying, Jody, it frees you from living mm. the burden. It, sometimes it's exhausting living a burden of, a, I don't know how people manage to do it, it's exhausting yeah. living a burden of a, of a life that isn't authentic. Just want to encourage you if you're listening to this take a risk invite someone in it'll be the best thing that you did and you'll be so grateful the other side that you've done it absolutely well it, i've thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking with you both um in conversation about integrity and um yeah i look forward to the next conversation so thank you for joining us if you've been watching or listening uh, we hope you've found it helpful challenging encouraging all of the above um, do get in touch if you want to uh, ask any questions or have a chat. Um, but until next time, thank you for listening.